Hello, I'm David Levine. Um, my guest tonight is Dr. Napuni Rajabaski. Um, I hope I pronounced it correctly. She's a pediatric infectious disease physician at the Mayo Clinic. Um, her primary research interests include studying ways of optimizing antibiotic use in children to decrease antibiotic resistance. And she has worked for the World Health Organization and has an interest in global health and outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases. And she also has a lot of, she's active on Twitter and she also has some YouTube videos about COVID-19 vaccine and, and kids. So thank you for coming to the program. We appreciate it. Um, why don't you start by telling us what the status is, is for the vaccines for five to 11 year olds? Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, this is a kind of a very exciting time for us as pediatricians and people who take care of children. Um, we know that as of right now, the only uh, approved vaccines are available for people over 12 years of age, but um, on October 26th, the FDA will be meeting to review data that was submitted by Pfizer from their uh, vaccine trial in children five to 11 years of age um, to decide whether to uh, approve the vaccine for, for that age group. And so after that meeting happens, uh, it'll then go to the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is an advisory group to the CDC that will also review um, the, the data and information and uh, decide uh, who to offer vaccination to. And so we're, we're really close now. This has been something we've been looking forward to for a long time since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, as an important step in uh, getting our kids protected against this infection. And so um, that looks like it is uh, just on the horizon now. So we're eagerly anticipating those, those meetings and the results of those meetings in the next few weeks. And this will be um, similar, a two-part vaccine? Yes. So um, Pfizer has uh, what they tested in their clinical trials was uh, the same schedule that we have used in teenagers and adults. So two doses uh, spaced apart by three weeks in between. Um, but the dose uh, that they have sought approval for is lower than the dose we're using in teens and adults. So the dose uh, for five to 11 year olds is uh, 10 micrograms. The dose in teens and adults is 30 micrograms. So it's about a, one third of the, the dose we've used so far. And um, this was uh, kind of come to based on the trial results. So they did test multiple doses in children and this dose was found to give equivalent um, antibody levels in this age group uh, as the, the higher dose. And so that's why they decided to put forth that dose as the one for review. And when, when does Moderna and Johnson & Johnson gonna submit data for their, for their children, for children? So, yeah, so um, many of the other uh, vaccine companies are uh, conducting trials in these younger age groups as well. Um, we don't yet have uh, the data from them. We haven't heard too much about when, when that might be available. Um, probably we will hear from Moderna first before the Johnson & Johnson um, group, um, but no, no clear timeline really on when, when those ones might, might be submitted for review. Both of those are uh, currently only uh, approved for people over 18 years of age as well. Um, and so we have, they have not yet sought approval for the teenage age group, and that probably will be the first step um, before they go down even to the younger ages. And how is the vaccine, before we talk about the children, how's the vaccine rollout been for um, people 12 and above? How many yeah. people, are people taking it? So we have seen, uh, so there's kind of initially some good uptake. It's been variable across different parts of the country, um, but like uh, some of the adult populations, um, we have seen that there's still room for improvement. Um, and so definitely there's still uh, many teens out there who have not gotten vaccinated yet. We can talk about some of the, the reasons that we're hearing um, for that, uh, but definitely we, we would like to see uh, more people in that age group get vaccinated. Um, just this week, uh, there was a report from the CDC, one of the MMWRs, um, that provides some further um, data to support vaccination of the teenage age group. They were looking at um, how much vaccine protects against hospitalization for teenagers, so some real world data since rollout. And the results of that study showed that um, the teens who were vaccinated 
uh, the vaccine was 93% protective against them ending up in hospital. So really good results uh, that the vaccine, once you're fully vaccinated as a teenager, is really effective in keeping you out of hospital, even if you do get infected with COVID. When they looked at teenagers who were hospitalized, 97% of those teenagers in hospital were unvaccinated. And when they looked at the teenagers who were hospitalized in ICU, so the sickest of those teens, um, none of them had had vaccine. And so the data kind of that we've seen in adults that the vaccine remains very effective against uh, hospitalization and uh, getting really sick or dying from COVID seems to um, hold up, hold true in teenagers as well. Um, also, um, so I also read that there, the Biden administration said that they're going to provide enough doses for five to 11 year olds for 28 million children. So uh, I guess that that's enough. Yeah, so I guess they have calculated based on the number of children um, in that age group and how many doses are required. So it sounds like they're uh, have been working to make sure that there's enough supply available and um, I think rightfully are kind of planning in advance of the approval so that um, if and when these do get approved um, mm -hmm. we can kind of hit the ground running to protect this group. Um, we have seen uh, in the last couple of, of months some of the highest rates of infections in children that we have seen through any point in this pandemic. And so um, we're really eager to get them protected as, as quickly as possible once the, the data has been reviewed and the appropriate approvals have been um, received. And so I know they um, mentioned kind of looking at different settings in which to roll out vaccines. It's a bit, bit different as probably most of us know uh, when it comes to, to kids and, and vaccines and kind of convenience for families. And so trying to use um, places where kids and families are familiar with uh, their pediatrician's office or primary care provider's office, um, potentially using uh, school-based vaccination strategies, um, trying to make it as easy um, and convenient as possible for, for kids to get this vaccine is also a, will be an important part, part of this, I think. All right, so I do, I do have a question. Uh, if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A box. Um, considering the low incidence of severe COVID infections in children, and the effectiveness of available vaccines in reducing transmission, um, how would you discuss the benefits of vaccination with hesitant parents? Yeah, so this is a really important question and I think a really important discussion uh, to have with families and we've certainly been having them even in advance of approval of the vaccine for the younger age group in our, our clinic with our patients and families as well. Um, we know that thankfully uh, ch most children who get infected with, with COVID-19 will have either asymptomatic illness, they don't have any symptoms, or they will have mild symptoms, which is, is great. Um, but there are uh, children who have died of the infection, including some previously healthy children who ha have not had obvious um, risk factors that we would have said in advance, this child is at high risk of dying from this infection. And then there certainly are children who we know have certain risk factors, things like um, obesity or uh, diabetes or um, underlying lung or heart disease, similar to some of the risk factors we see in adults who have had a very serious illness or died from the infection as well. So while it is uh, less common in children, um, I think it is uh, inaccurate to say that they have no risk at all. And uh, we now know from our uh, experiences with vaccine in adults and teenagers, and now with these trials in younger children that um, the vaccine really does give good protection and is the safest way to provide protection uh, to these younger age groups uh, to give them some immunity to the infection. Um, I think it goes beyond kind of the acute infection of with COVID-19 as well when you look at the, the risks of kids getting COVID. Um, we know that uh, kids, again, thankfully, uh, relatively uncommonly, but um, can get uh, really sick with a a complication of COVID-19 infection called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C. This is a post-infectious uh, inflammatory condition 
um, that can affect really any of the, the organs in the body, but tends to um, have impacts, uh, especially on the heart. And uh, there have been kids who have ended up in intensive care units with that complication and kids who have died from it as well, unfortunately. And the only way to prevent that is to prevent the initial infection with COVID-19. Um, and so that's another reason why um, vaccination of this age group is going to be important. It will help to reduce the um, risk of Miss C also. Um, and then as we are seeing kind of in adults, uh, these uh, symptoms of long COVID are kind of lingering more prolonged symptoms after a COVID-19 infection, even if the infection in some cases was asymptomatic or pretty mild to begin with. Um, we are seeing reports of this um, mostly kind of in the teenage age group, but also in some younger kids as well. Um, and so there's um, some uh, uh, thought that preventing obviously the COVID, the COVID infection might help um, spare some of those kids from developing uh, these long COVID symptoms, which can be quite debilitating um, and really impact their ability to attend school or do activities that they um, enjoy. And I think there's still a lot that we're learning. We've learned a lot about this infection in kids, but there's still a lot that we're learning about the impact on um, kind of developing organ systems in kids. And I don't think we'll know the, the full impacts probably for, for many years. Um, but for example, are there long-term impacts if a young infant gets COVID-19, even if their initial infection is mild, um, can there be long-term impacts on development of different organs and organ systems? I think that is something that we're only going to learn about as we have more time and experience with this virus. Um, and then I don't want to minimize kind of some of the mental health aspects this pandemic has had that has been one of the, the biggest impacts I think we've seen in the, the pediatric age group, um, just from the immense disruption of kids' uh, daily lives, their schooling, um, their daily schedules, their ability to interact with other kids and their peers, ability to, to interact with family members, grandparents, um, and having them uh, be able to be vaccinated and have that protection from the infection um, really is helps get us one step closer to getting back to all of these things that we've really enjoyed and, and missed out on a lot over the last year and a half or so. And so I think that's another reason why um, those are all kind of the direct impact on kids themselves. Um, I would be remiss to not mention kind of the community level or public health impacts of uh, including this age group in vaccination and um, we, we know that kids can get infected with this virus. We know that they can spread it, probably not quite as well as teenagers and adults, but they can spread it. And every new COVID-19 infection that we see is another opportunity for the virus to mutate and for a new variant to develop. And so driving down um, new infections and transmission as much as possible um, really helps to uh, prevent new variants from arising and this age group will be also a big part of part of that as well. So I think those are, um, there's many kind of aspects to think about when it comes to vaccinating children, um, some for their own protection, also some for uh, public health reasons as well as uh, getting us kind of out of this acute pandemic period. So as you know, there's been a lot of arguments about not, you know, not you know, going, parents not wanting to send their children to schools and ventilation and not wearing masks and things. And so it's been about almost two months schools have been open. Mm -hmm. How are the, how are, how do you think, how do you, how would you, what kind of grade would you give the schools? Yeah, so I would say it's been variable. We've seen variable things in different places, depending on the strategies that they have been using. There's been uh, kind of, unfortunately, this natural experiment that has happened based on some places choosing, for example, not to um, require masking. And so we have been able to con compare what is happening in schools with masking versus not. And um, the data is very clear that masking adds an extra layer of protection for, for kids in those schools and schools that have required masking um, generally have seen fewer outbreaks and exposures um, related to COVID-19 in schools. Um, that being said, kind of the highest number of new cases in kids um, we saw, I think, the week ending September 2nd, and since then, generally, week by week, we have been seeing um, decreasing rates over time. I think we were a bit unsure going into the, the school year whether things were going to start bad and get 
even worse over time. Thankfully, um, in uh, many areas, we have not seen that happen, though there are some pockets where there are still rising rates of infection. And so I think what we really have learned is that um, layering of these preventative strategies is really what helps to, to keep all of us, but including kids, safe. And especially in situations where you have, as of right now, the under 12 age group that cannot be vaccinated, making sure as many people around them are vaccinated. So vaccination of teachers and other um, adults in the school setting, uh, vaccination of parents, um, other strategies like uh, distancing, um, spending as much time outdoors as, as possible, um, ensuring good ventilation in classrooms. Um, when you don't have the benefit of vaccination in this age group, all of those other strategies become all the more important um, and using combinations of them are more effective than relying on a single strategy itself. And so I think that has just been uh, proven over and over again now in the school setting that it applies as well. So we're coming into holiday season. Um, mm -hmm. Halloween is coming up. Which, uh, as we know, children seem to like. Um, Christmas and Thanksgiving are coming up. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, you know, the, so the vaccines are not going to be ready. No one's going to be vaccinated before um, Halloween, obviously. And in terms of getting a fully, you know, dosed children, that's probably not going to be by Thanksgiving either. I think it'll be a, a bit of a stretch. So to be considered fully vaccinated, usually we consider that if you're two weeks after your second dose of vaccination in a two dose series. And so, um, yeah, it'll be, be a stretch to squeeze all of that in. I don't think if, yeah, it won't be possible for November, but by Christmas, I think it's realistic to think that there will be uh, some kids that will be meet that criteria for fully vaccinated. So what's your advice for families who, you know, they, you know Thanksgiving is a big traditional family holiday and people are going to be traveling on airplanes and trains and public transportation and having gatherings. Do you, do you think people are more, first of all, should they be having larger gatherings if there are children there? I mean, should I be going to a Thanksgiving with children, unvaccinated children? Yeah, so these are, are really uh, difficult questions that I think um, there's many different aspects to consider and a kind of uh, family specific, child specific uh, aspects to consider. So it's hard to give kind of a one size fits all answer to that question. Obviously, if you have um, a child with high risk conditions or you have adults with high risk conditions, for example, with a weakened immune system or something like that, um, it would be reasonable to choose to be um, on the more cautious side when it comes to your holiday plans. Um, but there are uh, things that you can do to lower your risk, I would say, um, with the amount of circulation of virus that we are still seeing in many parts of the country. Um, I would not say there's anything that reduces your risk to zero aside from staying home, um, but there are things you can do to reduce your risk if you do choose to gather with um, family and loved ones uh, this holiday season. Um, for sure, um, if you are gathering, anyone over 12 years of age um, should be vaccinated. Uh, that will help to protect everyone that's there at the gathering. Um, the Kind of tricky thing about Thanksgiving uh, specifically, it is usually a holiday that centers around food and eating and therefore uh, masking is difficult or you can't wear a mask obviously while you're eating. Um, but if you are gathering indoors, um, especially if there are going to be any unvaccinated people around, um, uh, we would encourage wearing a mask when you're not eating or drinking um, or consuming beverages as much as is practical. Um, and we would recommend limiting the gathering sizes for sure. Um, it is still possible to um, have uh, the virus and to transmit the virus, even if you have no symptoms and you are fully vaccinated. And so limiting the number of people who are there um, reduces the risk for everyone that's present. Um, good hand washing, uh, good ventilation, uh, keeping windows open if possible, all of those things um, will help to, to keep everyone uh, that's there um, safe. So what about the zero to four, four year olds? And that's a very large population. Are there trials going on for them? Yes. Yeah. So the trials um, have extended down to six months of age as the youngest group. Mm. Um, and so those trials are still ongoing um, and they are looking at um, first establishing what the effective dose is and then looking at the antibody levels in that age group as well. Um, again, a, 
a bit unclear exactly when we might hear um, that data. There have been some estimates uh, that before the end of this year, we might hear some reports from that age group, um, but unlikely that a vaccine would be available for that age group until sometime in 2022. Do children zero to four get COVID? Yes, so we, uh, children of any age can get COVID. We have had um, from premature newborns um, all the way up to 18 years of age. So definitely they can still get infected with the, the virus. Um, again, thankfully, uh, most of them have a relatively mild illness if they do get it, but um, they are at risk for ending up in hospital um, or ending up in an ICU or unfortunately dying from the infection in rare cases as well if they get it. So they are still susceptible. And are they, are they um, good at transmitting it as well? Um, so younger children, the younger you are, it seems uh, the less uh, efficiently you transmit, which is interesting because it can be different from other respiratory viruses like influenza or things like that. that we, when I had young children, I was sick all the time. Yeah. So yeah. usually they are um, yeah. very good at, at spreading it with COVID. It seems um, teenagers, so in the, when you look at the group of Pediatric patients will say there's different definitions, but under 18, I'll just use um, the teenagers seem to be able to spread it kind of similarly to adults. And then the younger kids, especially kids under 10 years of age or so seem to spread it um, less efficiently. Not to say that they cannot spread it at all. Certainly there are um, cases where they have transmitted it to, to others, mostly kind of close contacts or people within their household, um, but it does seem uh, less common. Okay, so I, I have another question. Um, have children who partic participated in vaccine trials experienced side effects similar to those experienced by adults? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, uh, the the full data set from the trials has not been released to the public yet. Uh, that being said, what has been reported is that the side effects, uh, there were no serious uh, adverse effects noted, and the side effects were similar to what we have seen in teenagers and adults. So these are generally uh, mild things that resolve over the course of a couple of days by themselves, uh, things like some pain at the site of injection, uh, maybe redness or swelling at the site of injection, um, some fever, um, feeling fatigued, muscle aches, those kinds of things uh, that last for a couple of days and then go away. Um, there is uh, obviously um, interest and ongoing uh, evaluation uh, related to um, other uh, rare but more serious side effects. For example, you may recall with um, the mRNA vaccines and the rollout in teenagers, there were cases of uh, myocarditis or inflammation of the heart that were being reported. Um, and so uh, that information has, has not been uh, released yet, but is looking being looked at very closely. And part of the reason why some of these trials have taken um, longer than we anticipated to get the data released. Um, but I'm hoping we will uh, learn more about uh, that information kind of as the data gets reviewed by the FDA and CDC. And I'm sure that's something they'll be looking at very closely as well. So children five to 11 differ. I mean, and like an 11 year old is close to a 12 year old and he's getting, he or she will get a third of the dose. Mm -hmm. But a five year old is pretty, you know, they're pretty, you know, they're pretty small compared to an 11 year old. Uh, how, what, what was the science in deciding that five to 11 year olds should only get a third of the dose? So they used a kind of um, trial uh, design called uh, immune bridging studies. So where they used different doses of the vaccine in this, these age groups, and then they measured uh, the antibody levels, and then they chose the dose that resulted in um, the most similar antibody levels that were seen in teenagers and, and adults. Um, and so um, when they looked at and the different kind of variations in age within this age group, uh, the dose that was a third of the adult dose seemed to achieve a similar um, level of antibody um, as the higher dose in adults. Um, and generally, we try and use the, the lowest effective dose that we can, because generally that's also associated with um, less of the, the uh, side effects, things like sore arm or uh, fever, things like that as well. So um, that was kind of how they arrived at this dose. So, you know, when COVID began, I don't think people thought that, you know, that it's going to be lasting 
as long as it has, and next February will be two years. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we will have COVID cases. I mean, I saw that Russia is not allowing people to go to work for a week. Um, Latvia is not letting people, it's locking down for a month. New Zealand gave up on its strategy to have zero cases and just um, mitigate as much as possible. And, but in, in some states, you know, United States, um, when the vaccine rates in Russia are very low, 31%, um, United States, it's 56%. And Portugal, I said, it was like close to 80%. So I think COVID is going to be here for a while. And um, you think until we get everyone vaccinated, that's going to be the end of it? Yeah, David, I think you're right. Um, kind of un unfortunately, I think this is going to be an infection that is not going to, we're not going to wake up one day and it's going to be gone. Um, I think it's going to be something that we're going to have to learn to live with. The higher we can drive our kind of overall population level of immunity, um, the less uh, circulation we'll see. But um, we have, as we've seen with how these var new variants can arise, um, it, it is not something that's going to, to go away um, soon or or quickly and probably is something we're going to have to, to live with for, for a while. Um, and we have seen a lot of um, inequity or differences in access to vaccines globally. And I think um, we're, we're fortunate that we can access, we have good access to vaccines in this country right now, but any uh, new infection with the virus is an opportunity for variants to, to develop. And so even if we have a highly vaccinated population here in parts of the world where there's a lot of transmission that could be a place where new variants can arise and um, obviously cause, cause problems for, for everyone globally. And so um, until we're able to have more equitable access to, to vaccination, um, I think we're, we're going to be, be struggling with this for, for a while. So I also read that there's a summer effect that um, kind of independent of what's going on with the vaccine, but that, because I guess people are outside more. Um, so, you know, in, in some, you know, in the Northeast, at least the, you know, winter is it's getting colder when winter mm -hmm. is coming, people will be indoors more. I mean, you know, um, I think for Thanksgiving, you know, if you're in a warm state, you can have it on your you know, outside and be, mm -hmm. and, and which is safer. So what do you think is going to happen um, this winter? I mean, also because the, the flu is coming. Yeah. Great, great question. And I was hoping we would have a chance to talk about flu as well. Um, I think uh, we have all learned that uh, trying to predict what is going to happen with this pandemic is very difficult. August was one of the, the worst months that we had in this pandemic, which was summertime and not usually a time when we see a lot of transmission of respiratory viruses. And so um, I think it's it's really difficult to predict um, where things are, are going to go next. And especially with the variability that we've seen in um, how closely or strictly people are adhering to preventative uh, recommendations. It seems to kind of track quite closely with how well people are masking and distancing or staying home and avoiding crowds and things like that. Um, we do know that the virus does not spread well outside, which is um, helpful. And so um, certainly outdoor activities we know are uh, carry less risk than uh, indoor activities or being in crowded indoor spaces. Um, and I think the same goes for, for influenza. I think last year um, we didn't know what to expect and we thankfully had an almost non-existent influenza season because many places were still kind of in lockdown mode. Um, people were quite diligent with masking and staying home um, and not having gatherings last year. But I, I think the, the sense is that this year, uh, people are not adhering to those uh, things as closely. And there's some variability in different areas as well regarding guidance. And so we are kind of bracing ourselves for uh, more flu. I think already uh, this year, there's been 23% or so more cases of influenza reported at this time as compared to last year. So we're, they're still low, um, but already seeing maybe some differences um, in that. And so flu is, transmitted in much the same way that COVID-19 is. And so things that we do to prevent COVID-19 transmission 
um, extend over to flu um, as well. Um, but we've seen some kind of unexpected things happen. Another respiratory virus, RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, um, which makes, we know makes kids, uh, especially those under one year of age, quite sick. And usually um, by November, December, January, February, uh, kids with RSV make up most of the kids that we see in, in children's hospitals. Um, and then it disappears through the summer. Um, we were seeing cases of that infection over the summer as we saw increases in COVID as well. And so um, really the epidemiology and patterns that we see with respiratory viruses have been um, a bit all over the place during the pandemic. And so I would hesitate to make any major predictions of, of what is to come uh, based on that. But we are certainly encouraging everyone this year to make sure they get their flu vaccine. Anyone over six months of age is eligible for influenza uh, vaccine, uh, just in anticipation that uh, for a number of reasons, um, including the fact that we didn't have a flu season last year and overall population level immunity to influenza is going to be lower this year. Um, that is one of the, the best and safest ways to protect yourself and, and your family from flu. Um, it would be quite worrisome if we see kind of concurrent surges of flu infection and COVID infection. Um, I think we're still learning kind of what these co-infections, if you get both at the same time, how is that different than having just one or the other uh, can do both in adults and in, in children as well. Um, and so, uh, and the additional pressure, obviously, that'll place on our, our healthcare system if we have surges of COVID concurrent with surges of influenza. Um, we're already, I think, here in Minnesota, I saw 96% of our ICU beds are, are full with COVID patients or full with COVID patients plus other patients right now. And so you superimpose on that um, a bad influenza year and you've easily kind of exceeded your, your capacity. Um, there. So um, really encouraging everyone to do what they can uh, to not, not forget about other infections out there, especially influenza as we go into the next few months. Um, vaccines are, are out. Uh, we encourage everyone to try and get their vaccine before Halloween, but really flu season has gone in prior years as late as March, April, into the spring. Um, and so it's really never too late to get it, even if you can't get it in before Halloween. So I got my flu vaccine um, in September and someone said, oh, you should have waited because it's going to wear off. Does it wear off? Mm -hmm. does, it, does it wear off? Yeah, so, so um, it does. There's a number of reasons why we have to get our, our flu vaccines every year. One has to do with changes in the circulating virus types. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other part is that your antibody levels and protection um, do wane over the course of the season. Um, but uh, getting it anytime in the fall, we usually say you should have it before Halloween is um, what is recommended and um, what will give you the, the best protection um, through the, the flu season, which typically goes into kind of the spring. So in years past, if we have been wearing masks, could we have, re have reduced the the spread of flu? Yeah, so this has been, I think, one of the very um, interesting or eye-opening things about this pandemic. We kind of expected that tens of thousands of people would die of influenza each season and kind of accepted that as being normal. Last year, I think there was very few um, cases. I don't want to quote the wrong number, but I think something like... 2000 cases and in kids, I think there was no deaths or maybe one death. And we see kind of up to a few hundred deaths due to influenza every year. And so I think we have learned that we, this is not something that we just need to accept or that is inevitable. We can prevent these infections and deaths as well. And so I hope we don't forget kind of the lessons that we've learned during this pandemic um, and some of these preventative strategies that, um, have helped to reduce the burden of other infections and illnesses as well. Um, we see, so one of the, the common uh, groups of patients that we see in our infectious disease clinic is um, kids who get frequent infections and parents who come in wondering if their child has something wrong with their immune system or if they have a weakened immune system of some sort. And so many of those kids that we've been following um, who have been out of childcare or at home uh, parents have told us that they have been the healthiest that they've been this 
past year because they've not been exposed to infections. People are doing a better job of staying home when they're sick, getting tested when they're sick, all of these things. Um, and so we've really seen an impact on, on some of these kids who used to get frequent respiratory infections or stomach flus or things in, in daycare settings um, because of stricter adherence to some of these preventative measures. And so that's been um, uh, maybe good side effect of, of what has been going on is people being more aware of kind of what we can do to, to prevent not only COVID-19, but other infections as well. So I'd like to talk about the mental health aspects a little bit because um, and my children hate when I talk about them, but my, they now have children of their own. And my daughter was telling me that she was so happy this summer that her daughter could have a play date outside because she didn't want to have, parents were very reluctant to have play dates inside, especially when the, even adults weren't vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And the, the, you know, the worry is that the winter is going to come and ch you know, children are just starting to be get, getting vaccinated. And I mean, children like to play, they, don't, they like to be spontaneous. And that's, that, that was a much, you know, that wasn't really possible during the, during the, you know, the, the, the colder winter months in, in certain areas. Yeah, um, certainly kids missed out on a lot of things that they enjoy uh, doing and that are important parts of childhood, both for their kind of social, emotional and, and physical development. And so that has been one of the big struggles that we've seen. Uh, we have definitely seen in the pediatric age group increase in rates of depression, anxiety, social isolation, um, all sorts of different mental health um, impacts. Um, and so bringing back some of those activities and making them safer uh, is kind of one of the things that uh, vaccination uh, gives us back. And so I know many kids who were out of school last year, um, families decided to go back to in-person schooling this year. Um, and one of the big drivers was kind of the mental health impacts of missing out on that year of in-person schooling and interaction um, with their peers. Um, I think this is why we we are so excited that a vaccine for five to eleven year olds is is on the horizon because that allows them to return to things like play dates with an additional layer of protection that they didn't have before. Um, in the the meantime, and for younger age groups, while we're we're waiting for the, those vaccines, I think um, there are ways that you can um, reduce the risk. I think um, definitely avoiding large groups of of unvaccinated kids makes sense. Um, but if you have a bubble or a smaller uh, group, if the parents are all vaccinated, that helps to protect that group as well. Um, doing it outdoors for as much as is practically possible, depending on where you live and what the weather um, is like, reduces the risk as well. Um, and then having them wear their masks if they're over two years of age and you're, you're meeting indoors um, reduces the risk also. Um, and so I think there are ways to do it safely, still recognizing how important those interactions are for kids um, and to kind of weigh the, the risks and, and benefits of those uh, types of activities um, and kind of being very clear and upfront um, with the parents of kids that your child likes to uh, spend time with and finding out, making sure that they're kind of also adhering to precautions closely, I think reduces your risk of having an exposure um, and making sure that anyone, everyone that's eligible is vaccinated um, as well. And so I think making it, it clear and having those discussions um, openly can, can really help to gauge uh, the risk of different situations also. So in, in New York City, they have mandates now that uh, you can't go to a restaurant unless you're fully vaccinated indoors. You can't mm -hmm. go to a museum in, you know, unless you're fully vaccinated. And you also can't go to um, a gym, a gym, or you know, athletic, mm -hmm. you know, or con even concerts. Um, but that does mean that you know, you know, teenagers are, are missing out on going to museums and going. What, what do you think of the mandates? So uh, anyone over twelve years of age now can get vaccinated. So right. the teenage age group um, should be able to to get vaccinated. Um, I think any. Uh, strategy that helps to reduce the risk of illness personally and for everyone in the community should be used as widely as possible and encouraged as widely as possible. Um, I think if, if you have looked at the 
the science and the data and listened to the experts out there, it's very clear that the benefits of vaccine outweigh um, the very rare complications um, or side effects that have been seen. And so um, when you compare, do the risk comparison between getting COVID or getting the vaccine, the vaccine is always going to come out on top as the safest way to get immunity to this infection. And so um, I think encouraging people to uh, do that to protect both themselves and people around them um, makes sense. So do you think this will be an annual vaccine COVID, COVID, or, or getting boosters? I mean, so, so let's say next September when you know, it's approved for everybody you know, above six months, do you think that children, children when they get their vaccines for other illnesses will also be getting a, you know, if they're getting a flu vaccine, they'll also be getting a COVID vaccine? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think one that we don't have a, a final answer to yet. We have seen uh, now recommendations for booster vaccines uh, come out or third dose vaccines. So I'll say um, for people who have a weakened immune system, so maybe someone who has an organ transplant or is on medication that weakens their immune system for some reason, um, we know that their <clears throat> response to the two-dose vaccine uh, series was lower than um, if they received a third dose. So now we have seen, as the vaccines have rolled out, a recommendation come out that people with weakened immune systems benefit from getting a third dose, um, usually at least a month after their, their second dose. And then more recently, we have uh, seen uh, that because of kind of waning uh, antibody levels um, in certain groups, especially uh, older adults, people over 65 years of age, um, that a booster dose given uh, six months after their second dose of vaccine um, seems to provide uh, uh, better or, or higher levels of protection. And I think this is something that we're going to um, have to learn as we go through time. It's kind of uh, almost impossible to predict uh, a year out from that dose, what the antibody levels will be, but we they are continuing to study and look and see um, what they are. And so could there be recommendations for additional boosters? Yes, um, that is possible. Um, or is it possible that this one booster after six months gives you um, more prolonged protection that you don't need one after a year, that it's another possibility as well. Um, part of the reason that is a hard question to also answer is because we don't know what is going to happen with variants. And so it is possible to have a variant that escapes partially or fully uh, vaccine related immunity. And if that happens, um, then certainly additional vaccinations might be, be necessary, but we can't necessarily predict if and when um, that might occur. And so there's a lot of different uh, kind of moving parts and pieces to that puzzle. Um, also measuring uh, immunity from vaccination is not a very straightforward thing because there are antibody levels that we're able to measure, but there is also this concept of immune memory that some of our uh, white blood cells can uh, develop uh, memory uh, to some of these infections. Um, but that's kind of really challenging to, to measure and to quantify in, in many cases. And so um, even if you have low antibody levels circulating in your blood, if you get exposed to COVID, it is possible and likely that these memory cells would then start to turn out more antibodies. Um, and is that enough to protect you potentially? Um, and so all of these things, the immune system is obviously very complicated and complex kind of play into whether this will become um, either something that requires routine boosters or also um, incorporated into our routine childhood immunization schedule. I think both are possible, but we don't know for sure. So I have a question. Should children have a special way of telling others that they've been vaccinated, such as a badge or a t-shirt, for example? <laughs> Interesting idea. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a, a good answer to that question. We don't do anything like that for adults thus far in terms of a visual uh, signal that someone is vaccinated or not. Um, and uh, I have not seen, uh, I know, people in some health. Their, people do on their Facebook pages. Um, they yeah. They surround themselves with the, I've been That's vaccinated. That's true. Yeah. There's certain logos. I know there's uh, certain buttons it's in some healthcare settings. People are wearing buttons to say I'm COVID-19 vaccinated. Um, 
I, I doubt that something like that would become mandatory, but there are certainly things out there that people can, can wear to, to show that they are vaccinated. And also I think, um, I know um, it can help generate some uh, conversation or discussions um, as well, if people have questions, if they know um, that you're vaccinated as well. So um, interesting question. I'm not sure I have a, a good answer to that one. <laughs> it might be fun for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think um, kids are very aware and cognizant of what their peers are doing. And so I think um, it might be something that that motivates them as well uh, to, to get the vaccine. Obviously, we when we do vaccines for kids, um, uh, fear and anxiety is often a, a part of it because it, they get a, a little pinch and there's a lot of kind of anticipation and um, fear related to that. So anything we can do to to try and make it a fun experience. Often they get stickers and treats and stuff after they get it. Um, I no, think it will be helpful. Of, there's also a lot of bargaining among kids, a lot of screening <laughs> among kids. And, uh, they, exactly. they don't go, they're not they're so willing, eager to get it. You know, so. Exactly. But it is important to know that there are things that we can, can do to, to make the experience um, less traumatic uh, for kids there are uh, things so I think talking to your child in advance kind of preparing them for what they might see or expect when they're getting their vaccination um, there are certain numbing or freezing sprays that can be used if your child is especially anxious or nervous um, taking something to distract them if they want to watch a, a video or listen to music um, things like that can all be helpful strategies um, to to get them through the experience is there a vaccine for RSV? Um, there uh, have been some that have been studied, but there are none that are kind of widely available uh, to be used. Um, there is an antibody product called uh, palavizumab <clears throat> that is given to the, the highest risk children. Um, there's certain criteria that we use to decide um, who qualifies for that, um, but it is a, an antibody product and not a uh, a vaccine, um, but uh, thus far we have um, very little to, to prevent RSV infection. It is definitely a, a cause of uh, major uh, hospitalizations and uh, morbidity uh, in, in our pediatric age group. And so it was um, uh, part of the reason why I think at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we didn't quite know how COVID-19 would affect kids because we, we knew that there were certain viruses, so RSV and influenza in particular, um, that children are at higher risk for having serious uh, illness and uh, poor outcomes from. And so uh, the initial worry was, is this virus going to be one of those as well? And uh, thankfully, we had some um, prior knowledge from other coronaviruses, so SARS and MERS, which suggested that um, those actually also did not seem to uh, cause very severe disease in kids, or at least not commonly. And so um, thankfully that has been also the case with, with this virus as well. Are there any children who should not be getting vaccines for you know, certain reasons? Um, yeah, so the uh, main uh, contraindication to vaccination is if you have had an allergic reaction to either prior dose of the same vaccine or to a component of the vaccination. So if you have questions, that would be a very, very small number of people. So if you have questions about your child in particular, I would say um, you can talk to your healthcare provider, but um, those children obviously would not be um, eligible for a vaccination. Um, uh, children in this age group, I'm just running through the, the list in my head, uh, one of the other uh, groups where we recommend uh, delaying vaccination is if you have received uh, one of the monoclonal antibody products. So these are um, antibodies that uh, are being used to help keep people outside of hospital, but those are not approved for kids under 12 years of age. So unlikely that um, that would be a reason uh, to delay vaccination in, in this five to 11 year age group. So vaccines have been pretty accepted for children. Um, do you anticipate the same acceptance for the COVID vaccines? I mean, I'm sure there are some parents really eager to get their kids vaccinated and some parents are saying no. I mean, just like there are for adults, you know, so. Exactly. I think we're going to see um, both. I think it's important to, to recognize that a vast majority of 
um, parents and families are pro-vaccine. I think sometimes the, the anti-vaccine group gets a lot of airtime. And so there's a sense that there's like a large group of um, anti-vaccine um, people out there, which is, I think they're more kind of a, a very vocal uh, minority, thankfully. Um, and so there will be both. I mean, I have had many people in the last few months reach out to ask how they can get their kids enrolled in the trials because they were so keen to have their child vaccinated and they knew that if you were enrolled in a trial there was a possibility that your child could get the vaccine and so you've got that that extreme and then you've got the other extreme of people who have said that they absolutely will not get their children vaccinated and so I think we're going to see both responses um, but hopefully I think if people have any questions or hesitations which I think is totally reasonable this is new vaccine for this age group. So I don't fault anyone for, for having questions about it or wanting to learn more about it. I think that is fantastic, but I would just encourage people to make sure that they're getting their information from reliable sources and evidence-based science sources. Talk to your healthcare provider. People are, are um, keeping a close eye on this. I know pediatricians everywhere are eagerly anticipating this and are um, keeping a close eye on on what's going on and we'll be looking at the data right alongside everyone else and so if you have questions or hesitations um, by all means uh, make sure you you voice those and ask people who can provide you with um, real answers to those questions okay so before i end i just want to talk about what well, actually there's not there's another question which is great what is the relative risk of severe infection in children of flu versus covid um, yeah, so that's a <laughs> interesting question. Um, it's difficult to provide a number for that, just because it uh, varies based on a child's age and their underlying medical conditions um, as well. Um, and so uh, it's it's hard for me to say you're 10 times more likely to end up, this is a made up number, but more likely to end up in hospital with the flu than, than with COVID. Um, but uh, we do know, um, so in terms of number of children who have, have died from the infection, that is also quite variable each year from influenza, depending on the circulating strains and vaccination rates and things like that as well. Um, but in, in general, um, we know that kids kind of under, the, under five years of age and certainly under two years of age um, who get flu are at uh, quite high risk of um, winding up. Uh, needing to seek health care, ending up in a hospital. Um, and so the, the certain age groups are, are at higher risk um, than others within the pediatric age group. Okay, so I just want to, um, upcoming events for us. Um, November 1st, I'll be speaking to Susan Shapiro, who's a professor at the New School, and she'll be talking about how to get published, which is uh, for Science Friars and Interesting. On November 9th, I'm speaking to Dr. Paul Offit, who I'm sure you know very well. Mm -hmm. And he's, um, he has a new book out. And he's also going to, says he's happy to answer all your questions about vaccines as well. And then I'm speaking to a woman who wrote a book called How Not to Raise Your Children as Assholes. And um, it's on November 17th. And we'll have more upcoming. But anyways, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us and letting us know. And I imagine the idea of indoor gatherings must be relevant to, the, you know, where you're in Minnesota. So it's going to, it's going to be cold. It'll be cold Thanksgiving, I guess. Yes, I don't think that outdoor Thanksgiving is going to be <laughs> realistic for us here. So we're hoping people keep their, their gatherings small and, and get vaccinated and just try and keep each other as, as safe and healthy as possible. Okay, well, thank you so much for spending time with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we're going to put this on YouTube, our YouTube channel, so we'll send you the link uh, tomorrow, probably. Great. And thanks again. It was great. Learned thanks for having me, and thanks for all the wonderful questions. Okay, take care. Thanks. Bye.